This episode contains adult language and distressing concepts. We've used voice actors throughout the episode to bring you the words spoken in court. Steve Wybrow SC is Bruce Lehrman's barrister. He's a criminal lawyer from Canberra, not a defamation specialist like the silks he's up against in the most high-profile defamation trial in Australia this decade. For the question of qualified privilege, that is, was it reasonable for the project to publish its interview with Brittany Higgins, Wybrow has collaborated with renowned defamation counsel Matthew Richardson, SC. But for the crucial closing submissions on the question of truth, Wybrow stood before the judge and made the argument himself. Although this is my first foray into defence against the dark arts, the question of reasonableness starts with... Why did this get broadcast at all? The onus of proof in this case is on the defence, Ten and Lisa Wilkinson. They must prove these imputations. That Bruce Lehrman raped Higgins despite her tears and pleas to stop, so roughly as to cause a large bruise on her leg, and then left her alone in a state of undress. Wybrow said they have not proved any of it. He said there was a sliding doors moment on February 6, 2019, when David Shiraz and Brittany Higgins went to see Emma Frizzell in the Australian Federal Police's sexual assault team and said Higgins wanted to reactivate her complaint. Higgins told the cop she wasn't quite ready to do a formal evidence-in-chief interview yet. Higgins had already done her interview with the project and told Frizzell she wanted the media coverage to play out before she did a formal interview with police. Oh, if there had been a record of interview conducted then. Oh, if she had taken the advice of the police not to litigate this matter in the media. If only people around her, like David Shiraz, like Lisa Wilkinson, like Angus Llewellyn, like Emma Webster, like any of the other politicians who had contact with Ms Higgins before this matter was aired, if only they had said, Brittany, this is an important story, but you should go to the police first. You should go and have this matter dealt with appropriately and properly by the police. This story can wait. Let us deal with the allegations you make against Mr Lehrman and we can deal with our story down the track. If that had happened, we wouldn't be here. If that had happened, we would not have had what appears to have been a virus of madness that spread amongst everybody from politicians to journalists, where sub judice just went out the window where the rights of the individual cease to exist. Wybrow said the project aired on February 15, and a month later, Brittany Higgins told the March for Justice she was raped. And since then, people have been hiding behind throwaway phrases like due process and the presumption of innocence. Anybody trying to provide a counter-narrative to that story is shouted down as some sort of rape apologist or anti-woman or a misogynist. Wybrow said Brittany Higgins was not a person who can be relied upon at all. Whenever she has faced a situation where she had some legal or moral or ethical obligation to tell the truth, she has demonstrated she has no qualms whatsoever in obfuscating, asserting matters she does not know one way or another as fact, whether they are true or not, but mostly telling complete falsehoods. Wybrow said the Rosetta Stone of this case are the messages Brittany Higgins exchanged with her romantic interest, Ben Dillaway, on the Tuesday after the alleged rape. Here's that exchange as tendered to the court. We've used voice actors. So I think I may not continue to be employed with Linda. What, did something happen? Yeah, it's pretty bad. I genuinely don't know how it's going to play out, how I want it to play out. If you've made a mistake, stuffed up, just be honest to her and chief of staff so it can be fixed. I've made some huge fuck-ups but owned them, said sorry, etc. Can I call you? I realise you might be in office, so can't take call. So on Friday night, how I ended up in the ministerial office, it didn't play out how I made out. I don't remember getting there at all. Vaguely remember Bruce being there and then I woke up in the morning half-dressed by myself in the minister's office on Saturday morning. I've spoken with Dad and he's flying down on Friday, was pretty upset over the weekend, so he's headed here to just hang out. That's good he's coming down. Was it just you and Bruce who went back there or a group of people? Did you hook up in there or did someone take advantage of you? 
Yeah, it was just Bruce and me from what I recall. I was barely lucid. I really don't feel like it was consensual at all. I just think if he thought it was okay, why would he just leave me there like that? Wybrow said she lied about her father coming down because she was upset. In fact, the father's trip was pre-booked and she hadn't told him she was raped. He also said Higgins only raised the alleged rape, not in an earlier meeting with her boss Fiona Brown, as she had claimed, but after Ben Dillaway had suggested someone took advantage of her. Justice Michael Lee asked Wybrow this. As I read the litany of communications with Ben Dillaway, this is someone she had a long, and I'm not quite sure how you define it, but it was still a very, very close relationship where, obviously enough, she felt she could confide in him. But aren't they consistent with someone working through in her own mind how she's processing this and how she's seeking to communicate it to somebody rather than a benign experience where she's waking up on a couch? Potentially, Your Honour. They're not definitive. That's why I asked Your Honour to take into account that it's put to her by Dillaway. Did someone take advantage of you? It's potentially a bit of a, a life raft, Your Honour. Now, Dillaway is the first to put that something happened, and in my submission, Your Honour, a plausible thing happens here, which is consistent with subsequent conduct by Miss Higgins. It comes as the genesis of an allegation which would be monstrous if falsely pursued. But there might be some benefit in just saying something happened. There might be something in, Bruce has gone, shut it down, do enough to give enough explanation to the humiliating experience and do enough to ensure your job's not going to be under threat. So does that mean that the logical extension of that was that what she was doing was to... Lay a false trail. The judge asked why she would lie to Ben Dillaway. He's put an idea in her head, potentially, of did something happen that you didn't want to happen? The judge said he put great store in contemporaneous written records, and Wybrow said Brown's notes were exactly that. He said the notes show... She did not articulate a complaint. She finds out for the first time because Ms Brown tells her she was seen in a state of undress. She's asked, if something happened she didn't want to happen in my submission, she shakes her head, no, because nothing did happen. And a horrific, humiliating and embarrassing situation for a young professional woman is that she is being spoken to about it by her boss. Wybrow said she later told Ben Dillaway she'd had a test to ensure she hadn't caught a sexually transmitted infection from Lehrman. That is a lie which could have serious consequences. There are criminal cases prosecuted on those facts. In this case, though, there had been no sex. She didn't go and have an STI check because she hadn't had sex with Mr Lehrman. The breadcrumbs and the falsity and the preparedness of Miss Higgins to say things that suit her narrative is quite compelling. Wybrow said other people started to believe the breadcrumbs and suddenly she was having meetings with cabinet ministers and senior staff about her allegation. She's urged at least to go and speak to the police. Just go and see them so you understand your options. That's all we ask. And again, what's the position Miss Higgins is put in? If she doesn't do that, it might blow her cover story. The court heard in the days after the rape, Brittany Higgins told her colleague Nikita Irvine the name of the bar she'd been at with Lerman at the end of the night, in a city karaoke joint 88 MPH. Another witness told the court she saw Higgins passionately kissing and touching Lerman at that bar, but Higgins twice told police she didn't know the name of the bar. If Nikita Irvine is an accurate historian in relation to that conversation, then Miss Higgins knew about 88 and falsely kept that from the police, consistent with wanting no further investigation. Not necessarily because she wanted to hide the fact that they might have been kissing at 88, but because she just wanted this to stop. And her subsequent and contemporaneous assertions that she was drunk, that she didn't know what she was doing there and how she got there, are also undermined. Wybrow said the snowball began rolling down the hill here, and as everyone around her began taking the complaint deadly seriously, she was in a conundrum. She told ACT Policing's sexual assault detective Sarah Harmon she would preserve the dress from that night and find out the name of the bar. The next day, she sent a message to Ben Dillaway, which she subsequently deleted from her phone, 
that she had no intention of pursuing the police complaint. The judge said her behaviour could still indicate a confused, worried young woman who'd been a victim of sexual assault. Justice Lee has been interested from the beginning of the trial in the role of David Shiraz, the former TV producer with links to Labor, who is now Higgins' fiancé. It was Shiraz who contacted Lisa Wilkinson with what he called a Liberal Party Me Too project pitch, and he was the main point of contact for the producers. The defence says they didn't call him because there was no forensic advantage to their case. Steve Wybrow said this. It's almost like a where's Wally. He's everywhere, but you can't find him in this. He's at the meeting, he's making all of these inputs. This was a political hit job if you look at all the communications emanating from him. The big claim of the defendants, Lisa Wilkinson and Network 10, is that Higgins and Lehrman clearly had sex and that it must have been non-consensual because Higgins was too drunk to consent. Here's what the judge asked Steve Wybrow about what the defendants say is Lehrman's implausible story of going back to Parliament and jotting notes on briefs for question time. If you accept some independent evidence, you have a 23-year-old man, had a lot to drink, out on the tiles with a woman he finds attractive, girlfriend waiting at home, ignoring telephone calls from her, woman's hand on his leg, passionate kissing, gets in a car, going to a private place. Now, does a man in a situation like that have French submarine contracts on his mind, or does he have something else on his mind? The judge asked Wybrow, what if he accepted they did have sex? Wybrow said the judge might well find that they went back to Parliament intending to have sex, but it wasn't necessarily consummated. It's a tad odd, separated from the notion that someone has had sex, that they just sort of decide to take their clothes off and lay down for no apparent reason. No, or in anticipation that this is what may be about to occur. Or because this is her favourite dress and she's, as she said to Samantha Maiden, she felt sick and she felt like she was going to throw up. And at the end of the day, my submission is going to be, you can't find why did that happen. It is potentially consistent with her having been sexually assaulted. But for reasons about her credibility, you would not find that. It's potentially consistent with them having had some form of intimacy. And it's potentially consistent with her either voluntarily herself taking her dress off, lying down or doing it in some expectation or anticipation that Mr Lehrman was about to come back in and that they were going to engage in some intimacy or for some other unexplained reason. Speaking of likelihood, though, of those particular scenarios, that's all I'm saying. No, that's right but it's a finding of fact in the absence of anything other than, at this stage, Your Honour, inferential. What is the more plausible and implausible explanation? And gets close to this notion of pains of informed speculation in the absence of some other factors. Lee and Wybrow agreed the dress would be difficult to take off a dead weight, a sleeping Higgins. Steve Wybrow played the judge a sped-up version of the four hours of CCTV from the dock bar. The judge found it hard going at times. I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I would rather stick knitting needles in my eyes than watch these videos more than I have already. He said it did not show Lehrman plying Higgins with drinks, as claimed by the defence's lip-reader witness, but backed up Lehrman's claims he'd only bought her two drinks that night. Mark Twain said that there are three types of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. I would recast that phrase as lies, damn lies, and CCTV. Like statistics, CCTV can be made to say anything you want it to, depending on how you present it. Wybrow said, although he conceded Lehman had not told the truth at all times about what he said were minor matters, Lehrman had, in denying any sexual contact, taken the biggest punt of his life. Wybrow said Lehrman could not have known if the police had DNA evidence from the dress or from a medical examination. Wybrow said if Lehrman was a guilty man, this was an improbable risk to take. Coming up, what Lehrman's lawyers say about the decision to publish the project episode. When he rose to deliver his closing submissions just after 3.30pm on Friday afternoon, Matthew Richardson, SC, counsel for Bruce Lehrman, asserted Lisa Wilkinson and Angus Llewellyn were so captured by Brittany Higgins 
that they never challenged her version of events regarding her alleged assault by Lehrman. Of particular concern was the photo of a bruise Higgins says she sustained during the alleged rape. Richardson said Higgins' admission in court that the bruise could have been the result of her fall up the stairs at 88 MPH wasn't a great start, and the project team should have had reservations about putting it to air. Richardson added that Wilkinson and Llewellyn's failure to ask to see the original photo, as opposed to the screenshot that was shared by Higgins in early 2021, was further evidence that they were so keen for their story despite their private reservations about its authenticity. He said it was inexplicable and inexcusable that Lisa Wilkinson either didn't know what metadata was, as she claimed, or just didn't ask for the metadata of that photo to establish if it was real. Over the course of his closing submissions, Richardson rubbished Channel 10's claims that they'd made genuine attempts to contact Lehrman for comment well in advance of their Monday night broadcast. He said it was contradictory that media inquiries made well in advance of the broadcast would result in a couple of scabby sentences in its final moments. Richardson asserted that that's indicative of how the project treated so much of the information that was at odds with Brittany Higgins' version of events. He acknowledged it's possible for journalists and broadcasters to publish material they don't necessarily believe to be true, but that their reporting has to reflect that uncertainty. In the case of the project interview, Richardson pointed to claims by both Wilkinson and Llewellyn that they expected the audience to believe Brittany Higgins' job had been threatened by Fiona Brown and Linda Reynolds. And Richardson said Wilkinson's claim that the project was only representing Higgins' perception of the situation was utterly preposterous. Richardson saved some choice words for the conduct of Lisa Wilkinson in disavowing any responsibility for the project's content, despite the fact she'd stood on stage accepting a Logie Award for it. He said Wilkinson had shifted the blame to the producer, Angus Llewellyn, and that if the judge squinted into the horizon, he'd see Mr Llewellyn on a barge, fate unknown, heading for the nearest market town. That is, she sold him down the river.